imagine my embarrassment and shame when I got that letter that you're no longer welcome to your university. And when you fail something, when you're blanketed with shame, you lose your belief in yourself. You lose your confidence. I believe social media has been the downfall of excellence and confidence in folks. I think we are doomed. It's not possible to limit it. And if we don't put our hand up and say, yes, I can do this. Yes, I'm ready to take this. Then we're not going to achieve what we're meant to achieve. What about the people that are out there? Nobody wants to work for anybody. They want to be their own bosses, their own mindset people. We got to do this ourselves, right? Dr. Ivan Joseph, born in Guyana, South America, and raised in one of Toronto's roughest neighborhoods. Through focus, mentorship, and an unwavering belief in himself, Dr. Joseph transformed from someone surrounded by doubt to a beacon of confidence. He's been called a rebel, a visionary, and even a troublemaker. I'm not giving up at the first door that closes on me. If you use three statements, three positive affirmations a day in the creative marketing world, you're 17 to 19% more productive. So there's nothing wrong with thinking and believing and walking in your house and having your strut and looking in the mirror and it's like, yes! But that's for you and you alone. And so sometimes like, well, is it, I'm gonna be a millionaire. That's not a really a behavior or an action. I can work hard to accomplish my goals. That's a better affirmation than I'm gonna be a millionaire. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Dr. Joseph, welcome. Uh, that's one of the best introductions yet. So thank you for your kind words. <laughs> Looking forward to the conversation. I would love to start off by briefly, if you please can, uh, to introduce yourself, especially your your journey from early on. And I've seen lovely pictures on your social, uh, on Instagram, and even your website, your blog. I saw a very young pit image of your dad working. I guess it was a laboratory. Mm -hmm. it, it was in the lab. So. And, and, and I know family is very important. I would love to kind of learn a little bit more about, you know, how you grew up and then how you really entered into the worlds of sports psychology and self-confidence. Oh, that's a long story, my friend. But, you know, um, <laughs> I'll start back. You know, I was born in Guyana. And for most people, when they hear Guyana, they think of Jim Jones and the Kool-Aid cult following and all the tragedy that happened there back in the 70s. But you know, Guyana is a small country uh, in South America. If you think of it as an ice cream cone, they're just in that top right corner, right by the equator. Um, and it's a country that is founded by, you know, well, it was a Caribbean country and it was colonized, I should say, by the British. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a lot of uh, what I'll say, East Indian, uh, African slavery, Dutch, Suriname, British, I guess it's just got a melting pot. And right. my dad worked on a sugarcane plantation. And so for your readers or your listeners to understand, instead of cotton plantation from the days of the old slaves here in South America, think sugarcane plantation, same thing, right? The British had all the power and influence and a lot of the, the brown folks or people that looked like you and me, we did all the work. And so my dad worked his way up there and eventually, you know, um, he became a lab technician. And when he was one day in the summer doing that, um, a professor came and said, hey, you're a pretty smart guy. We think you should come to Canada and do some studying. And he got a scholarship mm -hmm. to a small agricultural college and did really well there and excelled academically and found his way at McGill as a, as a, as a student. So when he graduated there, like many immigrant stories, he came and left his kids behind because he can't afford to bring the family. And so... I was raised by my great grandparents. And if anybody who's an immigrant that's been raised by their great grandparents, you know, it's, you know, it's very strict. 
you know, and I got the right. East Indian culture, so you don't fool around or else you get you get hit with the slipper or or, the, or you get your ears twisted or you get lots of corporal punishment. In today's world, I know it's nice time out. <laughs> Why did you do stuff? Right. But back in the day, it's like it's very structured, very, very tight and walk the line. Long story short, my dad did fairly well in terms of he was able to get a job, get settled. And him and his and his wife, my mom, brought us over years later at five, right? And so I remember for the first time meeting my parents when I was five years old. That was a different experience because, mm. you know, you, you've lost your number one caregiver. My grandmother, great-grandmother, right. raised me from the time I was one month old. And so we struggled. We had a tough time. We had a tough time fitting in. Uh, back then, north of Toronto is where we lived because my dad had to get experience. He was a hired hand on a on a farm because he was a soil scientist with no practical experience. There was no brown people north of Steeles. If any of your readers are familiar with the mm. Toronto, we call it the greater Toronto area. I always refer to myself and I heard my parents say it, the raisin in a sugar bowl, right? Just imagine what it's like to have nobody that looks like you, that sounds like you, you know, that, that you don't know who to connect with, where do you build community? And so there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of, I'll say, search for identity, which I wouldn't have used those terms back then. It was like, how do I fit in? How do I connect? How do I make friends? And I gravitated towards being the class clown, right? Just enough academically to get by, but really let's be the life of the party. Let's be the fun guy. Fast forward, you know, 12 years later, I went off to university. The first time being away from my very, very strict family and Indian and Guyanese and Caribbean upbringing. And what did I do with all that freedom? I flunked out of university, right? I wouldn't go to class. I would party. Oh my gosh, this was the dream. And imagine my embarrassment and shame when I got that letter that you're no longer welcome to your university. How do you say something to your immigrant parents who sacrificed and worked like dogs and did everything possible wow. to give this dream to you that you have, for lack of a better word, flittered it away? I would use some expletives, but trying to be, you know, for your family friendly audience. And so I, sh I hid, I was ashamed. I pretended I went to school. I worked at McDonald's. I pretended I did all these mm -hmm. things. I just kind of didn't want to tell them that I didn't have what it took. And when you fail something, when you're, when you're blanketed with shame, you lose your belief in yourself. You lose your confidence. And so I went through this kind of a shell of a person. And I took some time off and I reflected. And, you know, in my book, I talk about running into my wife and, and her interactions with me and how that built my confidence. And I've been talking a lot about this, but, you know, I went away and I started a new university. I started a new university and I was a soccer. I was always an athlete and, and I didn't get to play a lot. And it affected my belief in myself. Again, it affected my confidence. So here's a guy that just came out of flunking out of university now he was a star athlete. He was the athlete of the year of his high school. And now he's sitting on the bench of this university in the States. And I was being coached by a guy who was not a very good coach. Mm. And my wife said to me when she was my girlfriend at the time, she came and she said, oh, my gosh, why are you letting this coach who you don't who you told me wasn't a very good coach who you said doesn't really know a lot about this game that you played all your life? Why are you letting him dictate how you feel about yourself? She said some very powerful words, which is, why are you letting his belief about who you are influence your ability to do your job? And she was right. This was the first time that whole, why are you giving him your power came into mind? His perceptions, his belief about me said, yeah. And I started acting as if, yeah, he, he doesn't think I'm good. You're right. I mustn't be. He doesn't think I'm, I'm fast. You're right. I mustn't be. And when she said that to me, I snapped out of it. It's like, you're right. Because what happened when he didn't believe I was good, I stopped trying at practice. When he didn't believe I was good enough to play, I didn't wear my uniform mm. anymore. And I just showed up one day. I'm like, this guy is not going to do that. And I went to practice and I played like a bat out of hell. I ran people over. I went through tackles. I scored goals like nobody's business. Boom, 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 boom. This guy isn't going to tell me who I am. I'm going to prove right. him wrong. Long story short, captain of the team, all conference, all these things. That's when I realized the power the mind has in the ability of us to achieve peak performance.
long, long introduction, my friend, but that's how I got into sports psychology. Wow. Well, it's definitely not long enough. It's a, it's a great introduction and we really loved your story. And, you know, I, I love the topic of self-confidence. I think it's one of the most important characteristics that somebody can have. And if you, if you, if you're listening to this and you think you're not self-confident, you can become confident. It's you can, you can train that skill. My question to you is why is self-confidence such a pivotal skill in today's world? Well, we, I think we can agree that it's always been a pivotal skill, but in today's world, why is this so important for us to have? Well, you think about this, right? What do, what are people looking for in today's world? They're looking for entrepreneurs. They're looking for innovators. How many times have you heard that, right? They're looking for people that will, will take risks, right? Those are the people mm -hmm. that are out there. And then what about the people that are out there? Nobody wants to work for anybody. They want to be their own bosses, their own mindset people. We got to do this ourselves, right? When you think about this, the world is changing. It's not like it used to, right? And we think about new skills and new talents. The job that I did five years ago is not the same job. It's, it's technology has changed all that. And as good as we are and as talented as we might be, we have to keep up with this new ever changing world. And if we don't put our hand up and say, yes, I can do this. Yes, I'm ready to take this. Then we're not gonna achieve what we're meant to achieve. And self-confidence is this genuine belief in your ability. And so the thing is, we might be really smart. We might have a lot of skill, but if we're not opening up our mouth, if we're not putting our hand, if we're not saying, give me a chance, then nobody knows what we can do. And equally as important, then our impact won't be felt wherever we're working or wherever we're stationed. And that's the piece that people don't understand. How many times have some of you as listeners out there said, man, I knew that answer. Man, I, I, knew, I knew how to do that then what stopped you from saying it or doing it? That's that fear of failure and that lack of self-confidence. Over the last year, 86.6% .6 of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. You know, my wife used to work for a startup company uh, during the pandemic. It was going through hyper growth and I wouldn't use the word extremely self-confident for her uh, uh, at that time. And, you know, the, there would be meetings and meetings and the top, the top individual would propose a strategy. And many times she would get off the, um, after the meeting, she would say, man, that's not really a great idea. Turns out. She's right, you know, but at those meetings, people never spoke up and it's, it's so common. It's so common. Hey, he's my VP or he's my manager. He, he or she or they, whoever it is must know better than me. I, you know, my, my strategy makes no sense. I shouldn't, I should not speak up. It's, 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 it's such an important, it, it, it's, it, I think self-confidence should be taught to well, many different organizations, but especially in companies because the employees need to feel empowered because a lot of them do have great ideas. I mean, yeah. in, in the first place, yeah. parents should, should understand this topic and teach their kids about self-confidence. Because if yeah. you're going to be late in the game and they, you come to the company and company will be teaching you, it will not be so effective. So if somebody who is listening to us right now, our parents, this is your job right now to make sure your kids are preparing to, uh, you know, to embrace failure. This is the main, the main fear of everybody. They fear to be, to be failures. Mm -hmm. And there, there is not, not, so, not, nothing crazy about it. You can just fail and move on and learn from your mistakes. Yeah. So here's my, here's my next question then. How do you differentiate between self-confidence and then arrogance, right? What if somebody, somebody's thinking here, hey man, I think I'm confident, but wait, actually, am I confident or am I just arrogant? What's <laughs> How do we... <laughs> yeah. And you know, this is a, I, I have a simple line because I get this question a lot, right? About, oh man, this guy's egotistical. This guy's arrogant. And I want to remind people, self-confidence is what you tell yourself. Arrogance and ego is what you tell others, 
right? Mm. And so the person, like, I'm the greatest. That's not arrogance. But, hey, right. hey, Vlad, do you know that I'm the greatest? That's arrogant, right? Mm -hmm. right? So there's nothing wrong with thinking and believing and walking in your house and having your strut and looking in the mirror. It's like, yes, but that's for you and you alone. That's the confidence, the internal conversations and dialogues. You know, it's so, it's so funny right, right now, and helpful. just right now, before the uh, interview, I was driving home and I was speaking with my daughter in the car, just right this words I was telling to her, you have to be, you know, be confident in yourself and don't just go and if somebody is not asking you questions don't try to prove them something you know different that you are good that they are bad or something like this just you have to understand for yourself this is the most powerful thing that you can you know learn from the very beginning yeah um before before the interview as i was uh going through your videos and uh speeches uh, i you speak a lot about the power of affirmations. Yeah. So could you please share some practical, practical steps for those who are listening? What can they do? What are the examples of effective aff affirmations? So let's say after yeah. the interview, what, what are step by step they can do after they finish uh, listening? Yeah. To us? And let me even back up a little bit further and just make sure that we're all on the same page. Affirmations are powerful statements, positive statements, beliefs and actions. Right. That when you're sometimes feeling down or have fear come in, you use these to help you. Right. To help you overcome this. And there's science behind affirmations, because sometimes a lot of it is like, ah, saying warm talks to myself. And that doesn't help. But here's the science. It's from Harvard Lubomowski, Sonia Lubomowski. Right. Um, if you use three statements, three positive affirmations a day in the creative marketing world, you're 17 to 19 percent more productive right? In terms of putting out your collateral and your material. And if you're in the logistics world, analytics, complex problem solving, think engineering, mechanic, you know, needle in a haystack, or even a, a doctor diagnosing something, right? You're 23 to 27% faster to solve complex problems. Think about that when you're trying to figure out a budget or trying to solve something or a new idea. And finally, if you're in the revenue generation world, sales, three affirmations a day, three positive statements about yourself and your belief in your ability, increase your revenue from 27 to 33%. Can you give examples of this affirmation? Like in sales, yeah. for example, what are they? So in sales, right? I can be a great, great closer, right? Just like that, right? Another in sales, right? I'm not giving up at the first door that closes on me, right? Another affirmation, I can outwork anybody, right? My three affirmations, if you watch my video, I'm the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. Nobody outworks me. I can learn anything, right? I'm good at my job. I can do hard things. Clear, concrete statements. So when I say to your readers, like, okay, build affirmations. I don't know what to do. I don't know. Because usually by the time somebody needs affirmation, they're usually in a down spot. They're really feeling low. And so here's a simple right. exercise. Reach out to four of your friends. Hey, Vlad and Anya, can you tell me one thing I'm really good at? Can you just send it to me an email? And your friend might say, man, you're really good at this. Oh, my, I love your sense of humor. Oh, I love this about you, mm. right? Those, they're helping build your affirmations, right? And so sometimes like, well, is it, I'm going to be a millionaire. That's not a really a behavior or an action, right? You're like, I want to be, I'm going to be, you know what? I can work hard to accomplish my goals. That's a better affirmation than I'm going to be a millionaire. Right now, I'm a sports psychologist. Somebody might say in a coach, a life coach, that's a great affirmation. But I like affirmations to be something that we have direct control and influence over. Right. Nobody outworks me. I can show up early and stay late. I can learn anything. Let me read this again. Right. I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. I use that one when I'm feeling overwhelmed. There's a reason my book's called You Got This. When I got my promotion, I didn't know, oh my gosh, I don't think I can do this. Stop it. You got this. Is it is it important to say out loud your affirmations? Nope. There's no difference between saying out loud or speaking them internally. But there's it it How about writing it. Right? No difference. No difference. No difference. Okay. Right? Again, this is this is a sports psychologist. I've heard people say, oh, saying it out loud and writing it down. Nope. Nope, nope, no difference. But the problem is, is that people sometimes forget them. 
and they don't practice the mm. skill enough. So that's when we say, write it down and put it someplace where you can see it. Mm. Write it down and put it someplace where you remind, you remind yourself of it. Then, because the difference is in the amount of times we go to our affirmations. That has proven to be a difference. Yeah. And since we're, and let's say you pick three positive affirmations, how often should you change them? Or is this like a, a, a trend? Like, you know, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't have the answer on that one. Right. And so this is the thing about being a scientist, you know, like you don't want to say when you don't know, when you, when you don't know, you just don't say, right. right. So that's a good question. I, and if any readers have any information, I'd love to hear that one. I think you just have to feel, yeah, feel, feel what's right, what's right for you at this moment. Yeah. And if you're going to change them every every day or every week, this is, I think, a problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's, a problem. <laughs> That's a problem, right? You'll know. I've used mine for the last 15 years, and you notice how broad they are. Nobody outworks me. I can learn okay. anything, right? Those those are broad right. and general and apply to anything. Right. right. No, okay. One of my favorite um, speakers is a lady by the name of Robin Hanley Defoe, and she has one that says, I can do hard things. And I love that one. Hmm, I love that. That's a really good one. Right. I'm going to steal that one, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you also speak about the uh, thought stopping. Could you please mm -hmm. elaborate about uh, on this topic? Yeah. So this is when, um, you know, it's kind of a precursor of the affirmation. This is when sometimes we find ourselves feeling bad about ourselves. We, sometimes we're in this place. We failed. Um, it's I, I call it we're in the pity party. We've been there. Oh, my God, I suck. I can't do anything. I hate this. Right. And we start to globalize and everything, you know, you have one mistake or failure over in this area and all of a sudden everything about your life is bad. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. I, I just screwed up that presentation. I'm a terrible husband. I'm a terrible father. I can't do anything. I'm a terrible worker. Stop it. Thought stopping is when we start that negative spiral and you'll notice I clap, snap my fingers, deep breath in. Those are triggers, physical trigger to break that cycle in your brain, and then, then you replace it with the affirmation. If you watch professional athletes, watch them sometimes when they've made a mistake, you'll see them point to the person that made the great pass, or you'll see them clap two hands, right? That is, sometimes you'll see, um, you know, professional athletes when they're getting ready for a big shot on the free throw line, right? Right, right? clear the mind, replace it with pause. Oh my God, I hope I don't miss this. Stop it. You got this. You've practiced a thousand times. You're great. <laughs> I think it's also very important to realize that if you're not going to stop it, you're just going to harm yourself. Yeah. So if, if, you, if you're going to keep complaining, oh, I am bad, or I did that, some, that wrong, this wrong, so what? If you're going to mourn, so what? How it will help you in, in, in the long yeah. run, you know? So that's why you have Absolutely. to, as you said, just clap, stop, and continue. Learn from your mistakes. Stop yes. crying. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Stop crying. I know you do a lot of team building exercises. I have a question. Do you have any advice for entrepreneurs? Let's say the, the, the segment of entrepreneurs we're talking about has raised a significant amount of capital from venture capital funds. And they, of course, now have to deploy that capital by hiring, by, by building a team. Mm -hmm. But so many times, because we're in the space for now nine years, we see that many times the co-founders or the entrepreneurs, the owners of the company will make critical mistakes when it comes to building their teams. There's a lot of toxicity and a lack of trust. Do you have any advice that you would give to these these groups of entrepreneurs yeah. that have the capital funding? Yeah, so I'll say, I'll give you two, maybe three key points. I think first is begin with a clear sense of purpose about who you are and what your organization is. I've seen, and I've worked a lot with um, startups, and they start with their mission statement, they've read it, and I see them, we will do this and this and this and this and this. I worked with a, a startup that had seven ands in their purpose and mission statement. I'm like, seven, you can't be all things to all people. Um, listen, yeah. listen to Skype, put a ding in the universe. Apple, be disruptive in the pursuit of change. Zappos, live and deliver our wow. South Lake Hospital, give a damn a clear sense of purpose about who you are and what you're about. That's unapologetically who you are because you don't want to attract all kinds of people to your organization. The term I want to use is you want to recruit on the front end. Meaning when I was a soccer coach, I told everybody up front, hey, 
There's only 1,200 people in our town. What? Half the people left. Hey, there's no drinking on our campus. Another half the people left. Mm. Okay, girls sleep on one dorm, guys on another. There's no overnight guest. By the time I was down to 1,000 people that wanted to come, only five were there. But those oh. five were loyal and committed oh, and wow. dedicated. That's what they wanted. Sometimes we're like, oh, let's take it. And they, they, they will sacrifice the values and the chemistry and the cohesion for talent. No, this is who we are and what we're about. So number one is clear sense of purpose. Number two is a strong sense of culture over talent, right? And we think about this and I say it, and I, I know there's lots of books now out there, but back then there wasn't, but talent is overrated. When we talk about what makes a high performance team, there's two types of cohesion, task cohesion, policy, process, right. skill acquisition, how you do your job, social cohesion, how well we are connected to each other. Do you know the team that was most likely to win the NBA championship wasn't the team with the most number one draft picks, wasn't the team with the tallest talent mm -hmm. or with the most NBA all stars or the big time colleges. It was the team with the most fist bumps, High fives, butt taps, chest bumps, mm. gestures of love and affection. What we call in sports psychology, social cohesion. And the last mm. thing I think that's really important in, in acquiring talent, right? So we talked about clear sense of purpose. We talked about, you know, what I'll call cohesion, right? Um, and then culture, right? Those are those three things. And we think about how do we think about culture and cohesion? How are they different? Well, remember, culture is those things, those unwritten rules and mores and values that you share. And if you're not talking about it and if you're not reinforcing it, then they just wash away. Only then after right. those things do I then get to skill acquisition and talent. Wow, that's great advice. Seriously, great advice. I want to focus a little bit on social media. Mm -hmm. How does, I mean, obviously there's a lot of societal, societal pressures and the age of social media does this increase of social media consumption affect self-confidence? Has there been studies like that? There haven't been any studies like that yet, but we are moving in. There have been studies about its increase in anxiety, right? And anxiousness, mm. Okay. right? Right. In, in the world of sports psychology, there's this thing called mal, there's a thing called perfectionism and maladaptive perfectionism. So perfectionism, we all say, oh, that guy, he's a perfectionism, like A versus B, there's a C, like he likes all his details or her. The problem becomes when we have maladaptive perfectionism, when that perfectionism limits your ability to move forward, that can create harm. That's when it becomes maladaptive. And this is what social media has done to us in the social, um, in the social media sphere. Because what do we see? Mm. We see these things with the right angle, the right picture, get your chin like this. Oh my gosh. Right. Because that's how we always look. This is what that person always looks like. I was reluctant to come on your podcast like, man, should I go home and shave? I hate looking all gray because <laughs> everybody's going to think I'm a 53 year old man. Well, guess what? I am a 53 year old man. This is who I am. But, you know, my curated image, usually what do you see? White shirt, tag watch, clean shaven, brand identity, brand identity, brand identity. We don't see the failures. We don't see the misses. And so what have we led people to believe? That excellence comes with our first kick of the can. Excellence comes right off the bat. And if you don't, boom, right? Chin is a certain way. Filter is a certain way. I believe social media has been the downfall of excellence and confidence in folks. And I wish that we could find a way to limit our interaction and consumption of it. I think we are. I think we are doomed. It's not possible to limit it. Yeah. No way. Well, here's. Uh, well, your kids are older now. Yeah. They, they've already. They. Well, they're already in college or even finished college. Yeah, right I got 25, 24, and twenty one. Wow. Okay, so I'm like Vlad, Vlad's parents to young kids, fairly young kids, uh, three and six, and they already six. know how to use the phone. Of course, they're not yeah. using social media, but. Every day they're taking the phone and taking video of whatever happening in the house. So 100% yeah. we will not escape this. We are lucky that we've been born before it all happened. Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that, I will agree with you on that for sure. So well, since we're on this topic, let's talk about these constant notifications mm -hmm. and information overload because of these smartphone devices and TikTok and Instagram. How can individuals, somebody's listening to this right now, they say, okay, I know I've 
scroll TikTok for four hours and I'm so glued to my phone. Right, Dr. Joseph, how can I stay focused on my goals and avoid distractions? What do I do? What's that next step? Because yeah. I can't lock away my phone in a, you know, those like cookie jars with a lock or something. I don't know. They have these like weird contraptions now yeah. where you can lock your phone, but no one's going to do that. Is there any realistic advice you can provide or just like buy a well, flip flop phone? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Well, I've heard this, right? The average human touches their phone anywhere between 864 is the lowest number a day. Uh, and I've heard as, as much as uh, 2000 times a day, wow. right? Touches their phone, right? This is, that's the latest stat. And so this is the world that we live in. We have lived, we're living in the world of instant uh, media and communication and access to information. And so, again, I don't have this figured out, but I'm going to tell you about some of the things that I've tried and has made a difference. And I'm seeing it in some of my older peers. Number one, you got to have the ground rules for phone, right? No phone. Like, what, is there any places that are technology free? You can't go from zero to 100. So where are my technology free zones? So in my house, it's at the dinner table, right? It's mm. in the bedroom, right? So that's my first baby step. It's after 10 o'clock at night, right? That's, those, are the, those are the places where I'm starting. I wish that I could say, oh, man, I've got the answer. But I've noticed a difference. I've noticed a difference in my engagement and my interactions and my connections, right? Okay. When I used to coach a team, a high-performance team, we didn't allow phones on preseason. Nope, you had to leave them behind. Because if I don't do that, what happens is everybody's at the dinner table, a team of 24 people like this. And nobody's talking. And then yeah. we miss the thing that's important, which is the social cohesion, which leads to excellence and high performance. I, whenever I lead a meeting, I tell everybody, silence your ringers and put them away. Right? There's no phones in my meetings. Right? I find that disrespectful. Now, I can't expect them to do that without me leading and setting the clear parameters and expectations. So I would encourage right. you folks to take the baby step. Is there... And again, as I'm not touching my phone all hour, but there's certain spots that I'm going to say technology free. And that's that is, uh, yeah. And and on the phone, there is actually how how this uh, feature is called. You can set up like night mode or yeah, something. So it just it, it's just shut yeah. off and mm. and it, it's not even allowing you to unblock it or something like this. So you just yes, yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you can set a timer for for an app once you've used the use yeah. limit, right. limit or whatever the case is. And I think another part that you were hitting on is that we can't just, if we're trying to teach our kids, we can't tell them the rules and not do it ourselves. Amen. So, you know, like Vlad, for example, if your daughter's, if you're at the dinner table but you, and you're telling your daughter that you know, she can't what, be on the what, phone. What, Meanwhile, she, you're on the phone. She's teaching me every day. I am breaking this rule myself. <laughs> And, yeah. And, and yeah. As soon as yeah. I'm you, you sending me a message or Edward is sending me a message, I'm looking at the phone and she's saying, Father, we have a rule. Put your phone away. You know, she is teaching me, same in the bedroom, you know. I'm breaking yeah. these rules all the time. I need to I need to get back to it and follow my own words. <laughs> yeah. So it's the parents who need to change. Right, exactly. <laughs> Um, let's speak about the um, importance of surrounding ourselves with the right people. Oh, because this is really tough uh, to surround yourself with the, with the correct people, with the people like-minded, with the people who will support you, who will not, you know, laugh at you at your failures. So yeah. how, can, how can someone curate their environment to foster, foster self-confidence? I think this is so critically important. I, I can't tell you like, how important this is, is that the, you are the company you keep. Right. And we see that we see that because if we are with like toxic, sour people, most of us will tend to be a little bit more. Yeah, a little bit more reserved, a little bit more grouchy. And if we're with hopeful, aspirational people, we'll be there. And so you have to know, you know, one of the things my my dear late mother in law would say, surround yourself with people who are good for you and good to you. And what does that look like? And how do you know? First off, you have to recognize there's two types of stress. Distress and you stress. Distress is when things are bad and negative and cause you harm. You stress is good, positive stress. How do you know? And what are the symptoms of distress and you stress? Distress for me, when my skin starts to peel, right? When I feel frazzled, 
when I start losing my remote control or my car keys or my wallet. When I'm distressful, those are early signs that I'm in a state that I have to change something. You stress when I'm laughing, when I look forward to going someplace, when there's a bouncing my step. Well, how do you know if people are good for you or good to you? Do they cause you distress or you stress? Do you find yourself lingering when it's time to say goodbye? Oh, I wish this day would, or when it's like time, do you make an excuse? I got to get out of here. Are you reluctant to go in there? I, I don't want to be there, right? People are like, how do I pick the people? Look for the signs, right? When I'm really, really stressed, the skin on my palm starts to peel, right? Mm -hmm. If I find myself not liking who, I'm, who I am, I got to look around, right? right? I got to look like, oh, this is changing my behavior. I don't like this about myself. That's when you've got to change and do something about it. And it's up to you. You can't blame those people around you. That's you. You're making that decision. Sometimes we want to have the scapegoat, the cop out. All oh, these people are making me negative and toxic. And, and no, you are doing that because you're choosing to engage in that relationship. And sometimes it means you got to be lonely. You got to start over. But my gosh, I will tell you that you will rise. You will fulfill your potential if you create space and limit that interaction with the folks. And Vlad, it becomes hard when those people are in your family group or in your work group. This is when you got to decide, okay. How, how man, do you change them? Well, you, you're not going to change them. You're never going to, personality is stable and enduring, right? You're never going to make a toxic person in, or a negative person in your family love you better or be more warm or fuzzy. So what do you have to do is, you know what? I can't not go, but I'm only staying 15 minutes. Um, oh my God, I don't know how to get out of there. You know what, Bob? You have to call me and pretend I have a meeting so I can get out of here, right? You've got to put these, what I'll call tricks of the trade in here that limit your interaction and your contact. And I think, Vlad, you make an important mm -hmm. point for your readers. I need to stress, don't think you're gonna go there and change them. And don't think you can just go there and just shut it up and just suck it up and now I'm gonna get out of there. It starts to change you and you'll start to believe wow. them. Even if you just sit there and do nothing, <laughs> just yeah. be sitting there and listening, even not by listening, even if you're going to, yeah. you know, close your eyes anyway, it will yeah. affect you. Yeah. Wow. hundred um, percent. You know, we already spoke about the uh, negative self self-talk. So my question is why, why are we doing that? Why are we loving negative self-talk? Why are we loving to self-cry? Yeah. You know, it's a good question, right? When we think about negative self-talk and why do we beat ourselves up? And that's to do with our own self-esteem, right? Trying to just, I know I'm no good. I'm terrible at this. You have to remember that this is a psychological deficit and our brains are sometimes wired a little differently. And so there's no magic answer. Sometimes how have our brains become wired differently? Well, we learned this from our parents or some our caregiver. Right. Oh, I don't think I can do this. Oh, I don't think I'm no good. Or when we did this, somebody said to us, no, no, you can do it. And sometimes we say negative talk in order to get praise or in order to get love. These are learned behaviors from the way our brain is wired. We've had some sort of recognition or praise that has reinforced that. And so we have to unlearn that piece. Right. And that's the piece. This this whole self-deprecating, self-deprecating, self-deprecating. Why? Because if we failed, we want to explain away our failures. It's the way our brains have been triggered and, and wired to do that. And it allows us to become a little bit more greedy and resilient for some of us. Ah, yeah, they didn't know what they were missing. And for others, it allows us to, it, it, it pushes them to live in despair. This is where surrounding come into play. If you're going to yes. do the negative self-talk, at least if you have right surrounding, they can just stop you, you know, cut you. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Dr. Joseph, can you share an instance where you received feedback that was possibly tough to swallow, but ultimately beneficial from your growth? Oh, I had a report when I was a director of athletics, you know, after the first few years that we did pretty well, but then I saw us plateau. This is such a tough question. I remember bringing in a consultant. I said, I want you just to interview everybody and figure out what we need to do to get better. Right. And she made a report that said little things make big things happen. And it had the positives and then it had the negative. And like anybody, you don't go to the positives. I'm a high performer. We go straight to the things that are broken. And I remember it feeling like 
ugh, somebody hit me right in the gut really hard. And I remember writing myself an email. Oh my gosh, this is really hard to take, but you got to listen to it. This is important for you. But man, it makes me feel bad about myself. And I wrote it to myself because I wanted to share it with everybody because there was, I wanted people to get past their own insecurities. And the feedback was, you're not organized enough. You're too last minute. You change your meetings too early. Like this is, oh, yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. And, and there's stuff like, man, I don't think that's fair. That's not true. And I was okay. Right. And you know what? They were right. I needed to make my meetings 90 days out or 30 days out, mm. not a week out, not five days. Yes, I needed to show up with more agendas. Yes, every meeting needed to have an action and an assignment. It was hard because it was a personal attack on my leadership style. And when we were already doing really well, but when I took all that information, I started applying it. Okay, I'm going to respond to emails within 24 hours, not 48 to 72. All right, before I call a meeting, here's the agenda. And you know what? My meetings are always going to finish on time. Okay, yes, if I call a meeting, I'm going to give you at least two weeks notice. Yes, when I leave a meeting, here's the action items. Here's a summary. It made me a more efficient and effective leader. It was hard to take, but it was great news. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. I love that. Now, since you do have three kids, right? Yep. Th three children, yep. three kids above uh, above 20. So as I'm, as you, we, we've been talking about, Vlad has young kids. I'm about to be a father myself. Congrats. Uh, so I know you're not a parenting expert, but you, you've done it. Three kids in, coach, you've done incredible things. From all the mistakes, what advice would you give to both of us, right? So not the mistakes, <laughs> but... <laughs> Too late, I made a bunch. What advice can we take? <laughs> I mean, we can learn from mistakes. It's also fine. Yeah. We, well, you know what? That's the only way to learn. I, I think if I was to tell you anything is catch them being good. The more you can praise your kids with genuine praise about the process, mm -hmm. the more likely you are to build their grit and resilience. And let me give you two examples, right? If somebody shows up and gets, you know, you're one of, your, your son or daughter gets an A and they did the work the night before, don't praise the A. Because we don't know okay. if that was their best work. But if they did the work for five days and they worked really hard and they got a C, praise that process, right? Praising the process versus the outcome develops somebody's grit and resilience. Oh, you're so smart. No. Instead, man, I love how hard you worked. Man, that's really yeah. great. That's why you're so smart, right? Praising the process develops yeah. grit and resilience. Number two, catch them when they're good. Reinforce the behaviors you want from them and watch them soar. Watch them be exceptional. And the last thing is practice persistence. Meaning, yes, your son or daughter might be the third or fourth person off the bench, or they may not be the star player, but allow them the opportunity to suffer in there and work hard to achieve greatness. Don't look for them to have immediate success right away. Oh, they're not good in swimming. I better find them in karate. Oh, they're not good in karate. I better put them in, in pickleball. No, right. right? How do we grow their perseverance? There's the grit, the resilience, mm -hmm. and the confidence that we need to grow in our families and our children. I think par Such parents really right now will just because... cry when they just heard so the word suffer. <laughs> My kids yeah. suffer. Oh, of course now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Joseph, it has been an absolute pleasure going to speak with you. I do have one last question for you, uh, which is who has been one of the most inspiring or strongest person in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, my dad just passed away in March and that would be him, right? He was 81 years yeah. old. He left his place of origin where he had comfort and family and move to say, I want to create a better life for my dad, for my family. Right. And here's the things he taught me first, there, last to leave, right? The work mm -hmm. ethic be second to none. A sense of humor makes life go by easy practice, kindness and compassion. And last and certainly not least unconditional love, man, you know, what more could you ask for in a person? I had a great dad. Wow. Well, I, I, I know. I know. I can see it in your writings and the pictures that you shared. Thank you. Definitely. And is, is, it, is it, do you, 
can we expect a future book coming out from you? You know or? what? There's three books I'm going to work on there that are on my bucket list. Wow. The next one is called We Got This, right? Okay. About high performing teams and how to build confidence. And the next book is They Call Me Coach. Now what? This is about that new boss. I'm like, oh my God, what do I do now? And then certainly last and not least, I'm going to write a book about what I'll call when when one goes, we all goes. It's about the journey and the pursuit of our team to a national championship and how we beat you know, like the beat the odds and did something magical. Wow. I'm very excited for this. Dr. Joseph, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you today. Uh, you, there's a lot of great advice that you gave us today and, and the readers and the viewers. And for anyone who's listening, you can follow or you can find Dr. Ivan Joseph at uh, drivanjoseph.com. Or you can find them, of course, on social media, which is at Dr. Ivan Joseph. Fair, easy, and simple. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Take care, folks, and all the best.